All right, friends, welcome back. It has been a while. I'm with my bro, Paul Colodi, strength coach at Hunter Central Regional High School. This is the New Jersey High School Strength Coaches Podcast. We haven't done it for a while. We did this a lot last year because COVID gave us more free time. My school schedule was, uh, the school was shutting down at 11.45 a.m. So I was coaching uh, from 12 noon till like three o'clock. Then I'd come and do run my gym, but somehow had more free time. So we wanted to kick this one off. Um, topics we're going to cover today. Uh, we want to dedicate this one to Louis Simmons. And uh, we also want to remind people that uh, this coming Saturday, which I think is it's April 2nd, yep. we have the state clinic at Hunter and Central Regional High School for the National High School Strength Coaches Association. You could find that link in the link tree of my uh, Instagram bio, but you could also just go to nhssca.us, click the events, and it's so cheap. Paul, it's like uh, I just registered uh, my coach, my intern. It's 25 mm -hmm. bucks for him because he's a college student. Yep. I think it's $50 if you're a, you know, a, a standard member. Super yep. cheap. I, uh, yeah, you know, coaches ask all the time, you know, oh, we're, we're having <clears> trouble uh, programming or, you know, what do you do when you have a lot of kids show up for your room or kids aren't behaving or doing what you're supposed to? That's what we talk about. It's yes. not, it's not rocket science. It's every day, nuts and bolts, meat and potatoes. I don't care what you use, how to get a little bit more efficient in what you do. And, you know, I know Rob Bork's going to talk about that. I know you, you and, and, and Joe are going to talk about that. As far as the big lifts, I'm going to talk about those big groups. And if you do have 50 kids walk in and 25 are, are rookies. What do you do? You can't be, you, you got to be a little bit more uh, efficient in how you do things and organize. So um, I know your AD and your principal are coming in again, knock it out of the park because yes. what they did was a huge undertaking, two schools at once, boom. And, you know, when we were at the AD's convention last week, uh, a lot of great questions. And it was just about that. Uh, you know, what do we do? How do we start a program? We have phys ed teachers doing it. Well, let's get your phys ed teachers educated. Let's right. get them organized and they can still run it. That's not a big deal, but let's get them to know, to know what, it like, what it's like to run a, a program. Get, and, them, get them better. Just yeah. as I say, if as a coach, sport coach, strength coach, you want the athletes to give their best. Mm -hmm. Well, if you want to give, if you want them to give their best, well, you've got to do the same. You've got to study. And, uh, you know, on my desk, just a little like sentimental here, uh, you know, after Louis passing, I got Westside Barbell has a lot of these like mini manuals, bench press, deadlift. And you might be thinking, well, you know, we're not power lifters. These all have sports performance application. One of my favorite books, Westside Barbell Book of Methods, um, on my YouTube channel, I think if you, if you search books or go to ZachAvanish.com and search books, you'll see videos and blog posts dedicated to favorite training books. So I like to share those things, but I love what you're saying about not rocket science and teaching people application. And so uh, Mike Boyle, I've seen state this as well as other strength coaches who work in the high school area that your programming is going to have to change according to the equipment available. Does it flow? You know, so for example, um, at my private facility, the groups are not massive, but I'm not going to program, you know, dumbbell floor presses with some other thing like sleds where they're on the turf, you know, it's a dangerous situation, but if you don't understand how to make a program flow you're going to have downtime with the athletes or you're going to have time where they get uh, on where they lose focus, or you're going to have a dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. So I agree with what you're saying. Like we were telling the athletic directors, step one is support your phys ed teachers to get educated. Yeah. And so this Saturday, we're going to, we're going to blow the roof off the place. I'm excited. And uh, was listening to another podcast. I, I can't remember the guy's name. He's a high school strength coach in Wisconsin. But he said, it's so important to go to these events because not only do you learn during the presentations, but those in-between times and then the lunch break and then the social that's afterwards, 
you really get to learn and, and exchange information. And I heard Kurt Hester talking about how he like laid out a whole speed and agility program um, for linemen with a, another strength coach while they were at the bar. He said he wrote everything on a napkin, <laughs> like <laughs> all of the stuff. And, and it's like, that's when those conversations really flow. Um, so let's talk a little bit about programming things mm-hmm. you've learned from Louis Simmons, West side barbell. I mean, I really, you know, a conjugate based approach is, uh, the foundation of so much of what I do with athletes, but I, I'd love to hear what, what are some lessons you've learned from Louis through the years of learning from him through all that content he has uh, shared? Oh, I, I first learned about Louis and the conjugate program it's probably, um, 2003 2002 and I know he'd been doing it for a while then and I had one of my first employees come in and he was a big Louis Simmons West Side guy and he showed me about the conjugate program and and what it entailed and we started to to play with that with our with our athletes a little bit and this was back at the ballpark in our private facility and saw the growth you know the the hard work to struggle on those on those max effort days um, when they really had to 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 grind a little bit um and then uh, that, that's when we first started pulling sleds. We had a rubber floor, but we drug sleds on the rubber floor. And the kids hated that day, you know, forward drags, backward drags. And uh, that, that just, to me, it, it wasn't just about the functional training. Um, it was about the hard work. And that's what I learned from, from the conjugate program. And again, never speaking to Louis Simmons. I've met a lot of great strength coaches, you included, uh, over the years. and. Um, you know, I, I wish, I, I wish that, uh, that's somebody I could have, have spent a few minutes with and just to learned, learned his why and, you know, why he did things, um, not just from other people. So, you know, it's whenever somebody would, uh, podcast with him or chat with him, he would say, I don't give two craps if you buy any of my stuff, but as long as you get strong, that's what matters to me. Yeah. And so I see you're wearing the uh, Notre Dame Irish hat that Coach McKenna gave you. Well, Coach McKenna organized a uh, strength and conditioning clinic. It would have been, I'm thinking 2009, possibly 08. He got Louis Simmons out here to New Jersey, who did two days. He did a Friday night presentation, like from a podium where everybody was kind of sitting. I think it was in the mm-hmm. cafeteria. Then the next day, Louis was downstairs for those who know coach McKenna's uh, weight room was in an old, uh, I think it was an old bomb shelter. So the weight yeah. room at Notre Dame prep has all these different rooms. So uh, I had been chatting with Louis at that time, probably six, seven years. And so he said, Zach, make sure you ask me questions when I'm speaking so that what I'm talking about will make sense to people who've never heard about this before. So that was on the first night. Then the next day, he had me help him with presentations where he got into the special strengths, which to me was a very, it was like my, the most intriguing uh, thing I learned from Louie because of it, it helped me like get away from just sets and reps. So he was talking about uh, training a guy who was preparing for Olympics in wrestling and he would take the safety squat bar and do a walking staggered stance. Good morning. So he would take wow. a little step, do a good morning with the safety bar, stand up. He would do it for a quarter mile. And so he said what that would mimic is an athlete going in for like a high leg, high mm-hmm. leg attack where you're not dropping down to your knees and it develops the posterior chain. But he didn't say we did five sets of five. He said we did that for a quarter mile. And uh, he trained Kevin Randleman, who was a uh, three-time NCAA wrestling finalist. He was a runner-up freshman year. He wins it sophomore and junior year. And then um, I don't know if he stepped down from the team or uh, quit the Ohio State wrestling team. But when Kevin Randleman began training for MMA, Mm -hmm. he was not into jujitsu. He created him and Mark Coleman came up with ground and pound, take you down and and destroy you like hammer punching. But he said if people would get Kevin Randleman down on his back, he would fatigue. He's like, and because he didn't want to really learn jujitsu, I, he said, I, I attacked his weak points. So he would do uh, dumbbell benching on the physio ball for five to 10 minutes because when Randleman competed before the UFC, he competed in pride and pride fighting did not have a time limit. 
it was an endless fight until somebody uh, gave up or it might have a 30 minute um, Mm -hmm. time limit. It was very, you know, uh, how do you say, just like there was almost like no rules at at pride, of course, minus like, I think, you know, poking the eyes, things like that, (laughs) but he attacked his weak areas. And then another favorite of mine was, can't remember if it was 10 minutes or five minutes. I believe it was 10 minutes. He would do a, a clean complex with Randleman every 30 seconds or every minute. So Randleman weighed 205. So he put 205 on the bar and he would do a, a, a clean off the floor, a power clean from the floor. Then he would do a hang power clean and then he would do a hang clean and press. So it was a three rep complex with his body weight, put it down rest the remainder of that 30 second or one minute, and then go again for five to 10 minutes. So special strengths to me was a big takeaway and sleds. I bought my first sled from Louie. It arrived at my house with no box. It was a sled. The (laughs) strap was taped and there was a book of stamps with clear tape on it. Like whatever it was, 32 stamps taped to the sled. And I had gotten, um, off of uh, ACL surgery. And he said, I want you to go and drag the sled for quarter mile trips. And uh, he said, just take it to the park and put it around your waist with a belt and do sled drags with a plate. And I remember building up to like 25, uh, 25 minutes, 30 minutes of sled drags, but just with a plate across the grass. And when I did it, a uh, park ranger on a horse, like pulled me over and was like, what is this? What are you doing? And I'm trying to explain to him, West Side Barbell, Louis Simmons, they had no clue what the heck it was that I was doing. And when I look at why, you know, I posted on Twitter, why did so many of our athletes succeed? Because I implemented everything he taught me, you know, throwing medicine balls for time, doing speed endurance work. So instead of doing, you know, five sets of five or five sets of two, you know, do, do the 10, 12, 15 sets of two. Um, and so he influenced me in more ways than I can even remember. And he was so, so giving with his time. And it was cool as the internet evolved, Paul, because Mm -hmm. he started getting people to kind of manage the internet. So his quotes would now go on their Instagram and he would, people were confused with his training until more information came out. So he spoke about optimal training, not minimal, not maximal. He spoke about training matching your training to the personality of your athlete. If you have an eccentric personality athlete, your training needs to be more conjugate based, more Mm -hmm. variety. If you have an athlete who's more regimented, he or she will probably enjoy a regimented program and respond from it. So he was really applying what you were talking about, like meat and potatoes, nuts and bolts, almost like common sense, practical stuff. And yep. blended it with the science. It was like the ultimate marriage of practicality and science. So, you know, I could go on, on and on about those influences, but um, what's another uh, thing that you picked up from him that you, uh, that really hits home? You guys have sleds at your uh, facility, right? Oh, we have a lot of sleds. Um, but again, it's, it's not just that. And once I, once I watched West Side versus the world, yeah, um, I got to learn a little bit more about that. Again, I never met him. Um, I haven't read any of those books, Act, to, to, to be honest, but they're amazing. Um, yeah, based off of you know what I learned from from that employee coming in was just about it wasn't just functional training. It wasn't lightweight. It wasn't you had to you had to sometimes struggle. Um, I learned that you know the box squat. You know I went from from some of the things I learned that they never full squatted in their in their in their gym. They box squat, box squat, box squat, learned how to struggle and push from that static position. And then when they went to depth, it was, it wasn't that hard. I mean, it was hard. Don't get me wrong, but guys PR never getting down in that. And it reminded me of, uh, you know, when Greg cook first went to the Colts and he overhead squatted them for eight weeks, they didn't back squat front squat, anything. And when, and they were worried about, well, you know, it's going to be, we're going to lose some of our PRs. We're going to lose some of our strength. And when they finally came back and they went to back squats, everybody was PRing because they were just in an uncomfortable position for six to eight weeks with that overhead squat. And, you know, that's what the box squat does. It, it makes you push from that static position 
And now when you have to go down a little bit deeper and come out, um, it's not as bad as, as it was when you were trying to do it before. And it's, it's the hard work. And yeah. I never really understood that as a young strength coach. <clears throat> and, and I did athletic training for years, but once I started implementing some of that, that, that hard work, that, that dynamic effort with those hard, heavy loads, um, I started to see some of our kids actually become stronger and more resilient. Yeah. Jim Wendler once told me, he goes, Zach, do you know what dynamic effort day means at West side? <clears throat> I said, yeah, bands and chains. He goes, no, dynamic effort day is uh, another max effort day. He goes, because we start moving the weights for speed, but then the guy next to you just simply adds a quarter. And he's like, I'll, I'll go as fast as you, but I'll go heavier than you. And mm -hmm. so it starts off as dynamic day, but then it becomes a competition and then they get stronger and that dynamic becomes another max effort day, which, you know, Lou has spoken about. You're only as good as your training partners. And I look at the original underground strength gym. The training partners were tremendous. I posted something about it um, a couple of days ago. It was like, you're, you got, the strongest guy. Then you got another guy preparing for Marines. Then you got another guy who's, uh, you know, a black belt in judo and jujitsu. And when you have training partners like that, you are forced to get better. And so the culture of West Side Barbell, the attitude that people brought is everything. And that's why when I was a bodybuilder, I went to Diamond Gym because everybody was competing. You looked left and right. And the guy next to you was the one competing against you. And somebody was, you know, quote unquote, going to take your lunch if you're not lifting heavy mm -hmm. enough. So it was a constant challenge. Now, that being said, not everybody could handle that. Not everybody's emotionally prepared for that kind of intensity. Um, and so Westside only catered to the best of the best. But what you mentioned with box squatting and being an awkward and odd positions. That's what the conjugate method does when you utilize challenging and variable exercises. It prepares athletes for those positions that they're in during competition, because in competitions, there's no certainty. There's no absolute like, oh, you'll always be here. You'll always be there. And so that really hit home with me about training, you know, as Marty Gallagher called it, the in-between muscles by doing uh, the odd objects. And, uh, you know, I have an old video tour of the West Side Barbell from like 13 years ago. And you see kettlebells and different kinds of dumbbells and different machines and working different angles. And that's what you're doing. You're attacking weak areas. Some <laughs> of those guys would squat with a close stance on a six inch box. Then a week or two later, they did an athletic stance to a 12 inch box. Then a week or two later, they did wide stance squatting. So you're constantly changing it up. And so when an athlete is like, oh, I don't like doing it this way, or that barbell feels weird. I say, exactly. It's preparing you for when you're in sport for the, oh mm -hmm. crap factor. And then your body will say, I've been here before. No need to shut down. Like it allows you to keep pushing through. There's you know, infinite takeaways from Louie. He's probably been the most influential person in the strength and conditioning field ever. And, uh, you know, his work will live on. And my hope is that people give him credit versus saying like, you know, a, a thing with like my new certification is I repost a lot of other people's stuff because I'm like Switzerland. I feel like everything works, but as Louis said, yeah. nothing works forever. So you yeah. have to be learning from everybody and applying bits and pieces and then kind of, you know, uh, creating your own, you know, uh, masterpiece of work, but it's got to be pulled from everybody. And I love giving credit, you know, what Westside Barbell is named after the people Louis learned from in the magazines from the late sixties, mm -hmm. Bill Peanuts West who had West side barbell out of his garage in Culver city, California. Wow. And so when Louie came uh, back home to Ohio from Germany, from the army, he started West side barbell in his uh, basement. And it was to pay homage to those lifters out of bill peanuts, West original West side barbell. 
So we got a few minutes, Paul. Yeah. I want to go with another tip and then remind everybody of our state clinic. Well, yeah, and, and, and that's where I was going to transition to. That, yes. You know, uh, every everything, and, and I know a lot of people, there were some people that didn't agree with them, but respect is something that, you know, in our in our profession um, has to be given a little bit more to. And, and yes. I, I, I respect him for what he did for, and you see it across the board, um, a lot of the stuff that he did. So we have to pay our respects and, and, and honor him for what he's done for our profession. Um, and, and that is the meat and potatoes. And that's what I want to, I, I want to have people understand with our, with our state clinics that there is a lot of great stuff out there and you can get outside the box with a lot of things. But I think what, what Louie did was um, got really good inside his box before he did a lot of other crazy things like Correct. the squat pattern and, and how he did his work. And if we understand that we, we figure out how to organize how to run a program, then you can start to get fancy with some of the other things, but the, 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 the old school, you know, squat, push, pull, carry Dan, John, all of those things. Yes. That's, that's what, that's what works. And you can vary off of that. We can get as we have to get deeper with what we do versus and before we get wider with what we do. Yeah. We have to get more technical and how we do our things before we get more tactical on how we, you know, change them up and do things. And that's what he did. And that's what we're going to talk about. And I know Rob's going to talk about that, starting a program, everything else. You know, Rob is going to break down how they've run the strength and conditioning program at his high school, Rumson Fairhaven. I think he's been there 11 years. Yeah. Um, but he was one of the early strength coaches in a public school who utilized it during phys ed. So he's going to share the curriculum. He's going to share the growth. He's going to share the struggles he faces, how he runs teams during the day, uh, through phys ed, how, what happens after school with an in-season and off-season team. He's got a solid, solid program. So Mm -hmm. I can't wait to be a student and learn from everybody. Then we're going to do a little Q and a, Yep. And like you said, my athletic director and my assistant superintendent, he was the principal at the time. They're going to share the whole process to how they brought forth the idea of full-time strength and conditioning coaches in two of our schools. Cause we have two high schools, how they got it approved, how they communicated with the board of education and how they took it from an idea to a full-time position, which mm-hmm. is very rare, a full-time strength coach at the public school. So uh, we're going to crush it and uh, people could register at nhssca.us or go to Instagram. You'll see my Z Evanesh link tree link tree in the bio says the, I think New Jersey state strength clinic, they'll be able to do it. And I'll also put the link in the show notes of this uh, video and the audio, this audio is available for Apple, Spotify. We, we post it up through anchor. So it's available in a few places and uh, yeah. Saturday, baby, Hunter and Central Regional High School. Yeah, I'm excited. I got a quick, I got a quick shout out. Yes, uh, Zach, yes. Mike, Mike, Coach Mike Sandoz at Rancho High School in Las Vegas reached out to me. He listens to the podcast all the time. And he said, you know, what do you think the first thing is for me to improve? And I said, you got to find out who your state uh, you know, director is. And unfortunately, Nevada doesn't have one right now. So he re- he's going to reach out to the states around him, Colorado and everything Excellent. else. He's going to go out to the regional and he's going to make those connections. And I can't say how important it is, like you said, to get out to your clinics, whether it's regional or state, have those connections, not only in the room, but outside when you're having lunch. And, you know, I, I think those are those are some of the most beneficial the network. connections you can make. Yeah, you, know, you get better that way. About it. Go ahead, you, I'm sorry. You, you get better that way. Just through yeah. you expanding your network versus putting blinders on. Yep. So that's great. And how did he reach out to you? He emailed you? He emailed me. Yep. And uh, he said that he listens all the time. We were on the, we were on the phone for at least 40 minutes and he had great questions and it all came back to, man, you got to make those connections. You got to get out. He's, he's gonna, he's gonna register for the regional out there. And, you know, I told him he can contact you or me just like, just like anybody else. He can contact Kevin Vanderbush, you know, and Kevin will get back to him. Love so, it. 
Yeah. I, um, I did a uh, phone call with uh, the coach of the year from Oregon. He's uh, his name's Dan Leary and Dan wow. by uh, trade is a, pi- a helicopter pilot for, I think the coast guard. So he runs the high school weight room in Oregon. He's like into the kettlebells. He's, you know, organizing strength camps. And we were just talking about how to get more kids showing up in the weight room. He wants mm-hmm. to open a private facility. So if you work with high school athletes, whether you're administrator or coach, Become a member, nhssca.us, become a member. These state clinics are so cheap. It's like 25 bucks, 50 bucks. I mean, that's nothing. That's nothing. They're almost, you know, it's like next to being free. Yep. So Saturday, I can't wait to see you. We're going to crush it. We're going to have a social afterwards. And uh, thanks to everybody for listening. And please share this with other coaches and other friends. And uh, that's it. Spread the word. And uh, we're out of here. See you Saturday. Saturday, baby.